Good evening. Welcome. I just want to take a, a I'm going to kick this thing off here. Uh, my name is Chad Borowski. I'm one of the ski patrollers here, and I just want to take a, a brief minute here to talk about our new uphill travel policy. Um, there's going to be a little more freedom. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little sneak preview, but the rest of it will be on the website. There will be a daytime uphill travel allowed at Mount Ellen. We have a route that goes up along lower FIS off the trail, um, and you will be able to come down anything that's open, and you will be able to skin up anything, or skin up just that route during the day. Uh, again, there's gonna be maps and more details to follow. The other uh, thing that I'm pretty excited about, and John and I worked on this policy together, and um, he really pushed for the more terrain being downhill accessible during um, the non-operating hours. So we expanded that a little bit to include, we're not gonna go up to the summits, but off of Valley House, we are gonna um, allow folks to come down anything off of the Valley House lift. So you'll have access to Steins, Mall, Twist, Moonshine, as long as they're open and listed as open on the trail map. Um, and then at Mount Ellen, we're gonna allow access to Tumblr, uh, Cliffs, and Encore and Hammerhead during the evening. Um, if they're, do, you, we'll get into a little more detail, but if one of the caveats there is if they're winching on Cliffs, then all those trails will be closed. Um, so obviously we'll have all this information available on the website. The, if you are an uphill traveler, it is your responsibility to know what is open and closed, um, and that will be listed on the website as well. I wanna encourage everybody to get their uphill travel passes. The more of those that are out there, the more interest we see in the program, uh, the more energy we will put towards it. But if the pass sales, you know, if they tend to, they dwindle off, it, and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of interest then you'll probably find that there's the program doesn't get as much attention. Um, so please go out, get your uphill travel pass, be safe out there, um, and check the website for all the details. Thanks. Have a good night and enjoy the uh, seminar. Thanks, Chad. Great news. So, uh, welcome to the third annual Mad River Valley. Earn Your Turns Roundtable. I'm Steve Sharp. I'm a uh, member of the Mad River Valley Backcountry Coalition's Board of Directors. Uh, we are a chapter of the Catamount Trail Association. And we have a sort of multi-part mission uh, that includes both establishing in, uh, new backcountry zones within and around the Mad River Valley, but also focusing on things like we're doing tonight. So. Uh, opportunities for engagement, conversation, education around backcountry safety, backcountry etiquette, and conservation of the mountains that we have and love. So we're here tonight because I think we've all observed, at least those who are here and, and beyond, that there's been a growing interest and uh, demand for uh, getting out in the backcountry. Sometimes it's uh, folks who are interested in, in coming to the valley ski areas, uh, both those who uh, ride lifts and those who skin up. In most cases, they're one and the same, like myself. But that growing demand also means that there's questions about impacts. Uh, the impact could be, for example, here at the ski area, what kind of impacts does this mean for the operation? Tonight, we're actually not focused on that. Tonight, our focus is more, what are the ecological impacts that uh, could transpire as we potentially create more of these managed trails and zones in Vermont. What are the things we need to consider as, as we approach that? Uh, I'd like to say a thank you again to Sugarbush for the venue, Catamount Trail Association. They are our parent organization, and uh, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't exist. Uh, I'd also like to do a quick shout out to our annual sponsors, Jameson Insurance, Lawson's Finest Liquids, Onion River Outdoors, Clearwater Sports, Broadleaf Landscape Architecture, Maneo Brock, and Mad River Glen. Um, 
at this point, I think I'd like to, to transition to inter a quick introduction here and, and a quick explanation of how the evening is going to go. We're going to, we, we have uh, three panelists uh, who are going to be doing some presentations, and then we're going to have some moderated que questions that come from the moderator, and then we'll go to the audience. So let me do quick introductions. We have Catherine Wrigley here. She's with Vermont Forest and Parks. She's a forest research specialist. We have Bob Zeno, who is with Fish and Wildlife, and he's a state lands ecologist. And we have Caitlin Littlefield. She's a scientist with the Conservation Science Partners. And last, we have Matt Williams, who's the executive director of the Catamount Trail Association. He's going to be our moderator tonight. So thanks again for being here. works here. Um, thank you all for being here. As, as Steve mentioned, my name is Matt Williams. I'm the executive director at the Catamount Trail Association. And uh, I just want to thank you all for, for being here tonight um, at this event. And thank you to all of our panelists for, for joining us. Um, you know, Steve mentioned, and, it, and we all know that use in the backcountry um, is, is higher than it's probably ever been. Um, the, the Catamount Trail does a, a fair amount of um, monitoring of, of high use trailheads in Vermont. And we've seen some of the more popular trailheads for backcountry skiers. We've seen use double or even triple over the last two to three years. And I, I think that's um, pretty clear anecdotally to anybody who's been skiing in, in the backcountry in Vermont um, for any length of time. There's a lot of amazing and great things about that. And we love seeing more people in the woods. And we love knowing that more people are getting that experience. It's a pretty special thing. Um, to traverse the Vermont's backcountry in the winter and to, to explore the incredible landscape that we all are lucky enough to call home. Uh, but we also know that they, that creates some impact. Um, and the development of managed backcountry zones, I think, has been a wonderful thing for communities. It's been a great thing for skiers in Vermont. Uh, but that leads to some impacts as well. And um, something that the, the CTA and our chapters are certainly very um, interested in is making sure that we're doing what we can to learn um, from the best science that's out there and, and to make sure that we're minimizing our impact on the landscape to the best of our ability um, and, and doing what we can to balance those, those really positive um, experiences for, for skiers and really positive community impacts um, with, with impacts to the ecological landscape. So I'm really thrilled um, to be here tonight, and I, I thank MRVBC for helping to push this conversation forward, and I'm um, really um, excited to, to hear what our panelists have to say um, tonight, and, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning some things, and, and I hope you all will too. Um, so we're gonna kick things off. I think Catherine is going to get us going here with just a, uh, an overview of what it really means when we talk about a managed backcountry ski zone. Um, this is a new, really a new development in the, in the world of backcountry skiing. Brandon Gap um, and Braintree Forest, um, which are two zones managed by the Ridgeline Outdoor Collective, a, a chapter to the, to the south of us, or the first managed backcountry terrain really anywhere in the country um, on U.S. Forest Service land and, and a private parcel in Braintree. Um, and that, those are only about six or seven years old. So um, we'll just start with a, an overview of what it is that we're really talking about with managed zones here and then, and then move, move on from there. So uh, Catherine, I'll, I'll pass it off to you. Hello, can you hear me? I haven't used a microphone in a long time. Um, hello, I'm Catherine. Oh, something's happening. Right into it. All right. Whew. Um, I'm Catherine Wrigley. Um, I'm actually a forest recreation specialist. I forgot. It's my fault. I should have um, caught that in the email exchange prior to this. Um, but I just wanted to let people know. I have done research, but my current job, that's not my title. Um, uh, my background is in um, ecology and 
uh, forestry. And I worked f for the Green Mountain Club for about five years prior to going back to grad school to do some more research on ecology and forestry. I just couldn't get enough of it after graduating from UVM in 2005 with an ecology degree. I was like, I gotta go back for more. Uh, I was first introduced to backcountry skiing when I disappointed my parents by becoming a ski bum after getting my bachelor's. Uh, I moved out to Crested Butte because a bunch of my friends moved there. Uh, it's out in Colorado. And that's where I first backcountry skied. And then, lo and behold, now I get to talk about it for work. So that, that worked out, parents. So thank you. Um, so I'm here to talk about a backcountry ski zone overview. Um, I've taken a lot of what I'm talking about today from either my previous research and or um, the Backcountry Ski Manual, which has been bubbling around for two-ish years, and I actually got the, I think that it's out for signature now, and by that I mean I think that hopefully we should have like a pretty version of it by sometime in the spring, and I'll let you know, but maybe not. Um, so what is a managed backcountry ski zone? Slide. As many of you probably know, there are a lot of ways to move around the woods on skis. Uh, this is from a book about backcountry skiing, and it shows that there's a bunch of ways to get uphill. Um, and I just like this picture to like show that we're all doing different things outside. Um, slide. And in the backcountry ski manual, we define um, six, six types of access. So dispersed access we, is sort of just like, um, sort of traditional, like what has been going on in Vermont and across the landscape for a really long time. You go out with, by yourself or your buddies, you ski around, you may be on AT stuff, Telemark, Nordic. Um, you're just kind of exploring the terrain. You're probably more advanced with your skiing. Uh, Cross-country touring, um, the Catamount Trail Association, which is here, has this amazing trail that goes the whole length of Vermont. Uh, you can jump on that and explore um, all sorts of terrain um, for cross-country touring. Um, and that's more like you're going from point to point. Side country skiing, we included as just to note that um, it is some people's introduction to backcountry skiing, although it technically isn't backcountry skiing. Um, you're skiing um, backcountry terrain that's accessed via the lift. I don't have all my notes, so I might be saying this a little bit differently than I would have if I was reading all my notes. Um, ephemeral skiing is um, when you're able to ski a location that has a, there's been a disturbance. Um, maybe there was a landslide, maybe there was a um, silvicultural activity, um, and you can ski that for a handful of years, but then uh, it goes away because things grow in it and you can't ski there anymore. Um, historic backcountry skiing sites are places like Teardrop, over in Mount Mansfield State Forest. That's in my district. I forgot to mention I work out of the Essex Junction office, so Northwest Vermont. Um, these are the places that are most likely found in um, Goodman's book. Uh, they're places that are kind of like open secrets of where to ski. Um, and the people who ski these might be new, new people who are just like looking for spots to ski or um, peak baggers or basically any, anyone who's interested in, in backcountry skiing. A sanctioned backcountry ski zone um, is an intentionally designed um, area that has gone through a process to decide that that's where we want skiing to happen. Because I think that the thing I didn't stress in the first five is that we don't want to see any um, removal of vegetation. And in a sanctioned backcountry ski zone, we've gone through a rigorous um, process of review. Um, and there is landowner input on what will and will not be removed and where you will and will not ski. So if you go to the next slide, um, hopefully the Forest Service doesn't mind. I borrowed your sick picture. Um, that's a vegetation island in the middle. 
um, and then it shows all the lines around it. Um, so this is an area that is intentionally designated through a deliberative review and approval process with the landowner. Um, and from previous research, zones are um, helpful for ecology and wildlife and other things that we'll get into because it concentrates a use in one location. Um, and so the last slide, the other thing that's really helpful about backcountry ski zones is that it gives us this opportunity to do really directed stewardship messaging and to work with groups like MRVBC to really connect with people who want to be out there um, using the landscape. Uh, and it gives us an opportunity to educate them on like the best way that they can have fun while respecting the resource. Um, and by the resource, I mean the forest, the soil, the water, all, all of the parts. Um, insects, I feel like entomologists always get upset because insects get overlooked, so insects. Um, and then if you, and part of that ethic, um, the, the Vermont backcountry ethics were created um, here in Vermont, which is amazing. And if you could um, go to the next slide. One of the things I just really want to call out, because this is of special importance, um, is the leave things as they are. Uh, this is leave only tracks and we really wanna focus on that there's no authorized cutting allowed. Um, because you can ski, I don't wanna speak for the Forest Service, but on most F state land, most not all, you can backcountry ski if you're not removing vegetation. Um, so, uh, this is a leave only tracks, no unauthorized cutting. And the reason that I continually bring this up is, if you do this slide, is because there's actually a law, the Vermont Timber Trespass Statute, um, that codifies unauthorized cutting or damaging of trees, bush bushes, <laughs> or shrubs of any size as a criminal offense in addition to a cause for civil action. Um, and any size means like seedling. like. And it's like fifty dollars per tree. They've, they've. I won't go into it, but if you're interested, you can Google it, and there's a way that they can tell you how much like each type of tree would cost. Um, but I just want to stress that so this backcountry ski zone is like intentionally trying to understand where cutting is happening across the landscape because that's um, one of the main triggers for like ecological impact, which we'll get into later. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. I'll, I'll just add a couple of quick things about, about managed backcountry zones, just um, if there are folks here tonight or, or folks tuning in later who haven't been to one, there's just a, beyond sort of the, the ecological reasons for doing it, some other things you'll find consistently are marked parking with a, with a kiosk and a, a map at the trailhead. Um, a sign and marked skin track to the top, so there's a designated route to the top of the zone. And then sometimes the, the routes, the, um, the managed terrain has sort of essentially trail signs at the top, sometimes not. Um, but, but there is sort of that consistent um, look and feel to them across the state. They are um, a backcountry experience. Um, but it is somewhat facilitated in that you have a designated route to ski up, you have sort of designated ways to get back down, um, and it, you, know, you know there's places to park and, and that sort of thing. Um, which, and we'll get into it later, but there, there are other, you know, safety reasons and, and all sorts of other um, reasons to do that. But just when, we, when we're talking about these zones over the course of the, the night, you know, other, just other things to keep in mind, um, sort of big picture. But, um, Thanks again. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it off to um, I think Bob or Bob's up, and Bob and Caitlin are up up next. Um, to talk about sort of what impacts where we really want to pay attention to with with this use. Thank you, Matt. So yeah, I'll start in here. I'm Caitlin Littlefield. I'm a, a, a landscape ecologist with Conservation Science Partners, which is a little. Uh, research outfit. Uh, we're largely based out west on the lone outpost here in Vermont, but um, I carry forth a lot of the research that I've done at the University of Washington and Montana and University of Vermont. Um, and like Catherine, immediately after undergrad, 
disappointed my parents by moving to Alta, and that was my first introduction to a lot of backcountry skiing, but uh, eventually returns to the world of academia, and I'm really glad to carry this research forward and come here to talk about it today. So I'm wearing two hats then, one as a, a landscape ecologist, so a researcher, and another hat, if we have the chance to get into it, is I serve on the Andrews Community Forest Committee in the town of Richmond, and we're currently going through a process of designing a trail network, um, and I'm happy to share some of the lessons lessons learned. Okay. Is that better? Yeah? Okay. So yeah, happy to share some lessons learned associated with that trail design process, which has become um, a little interesting, I'll say. Uh, fairly contentious. So yeah, to start talking about impacts, though, of backcountry skiing, which will then funnel into a conversation about how we learn from those impacts to potentially site backcountry ski zones. I'm going to start us off at the broad landscape scale. So yeah, you can go ahead and, and take that over, thanks. So, so when we talk about impacts of skiing in the backcountry, it's pretty easy to think of, okay, well, whoops, I just sideswiped that little spruce seedling, or oh, there goes a fox running off away from me. But let's also remember that we're embedded in this much broader landscape. It's not just the forest and the habitat and the critters that are right there. It's also a much bigger landscape of connected forest. And so that's the lens that I want to bring to this conversation about impacts, which is that we need to think about maintaining and not inhibiting landscape connectivity. And that's a really kind of a key tenet of thinking about conservation at broad scales. So what do I mean by connectivity? I mean really the degree to which wildlife, plants and animals, all sorts of organisms can move across the landscape uninhibited. So how permeable is the landscape? And for many critters, they're, they're steering clear places where, where humans are. So maybe, you know, with an exception of like raccoons and crows, those elusive top carnivores and big mammals that you probably haven't ever seen in your life and you may not, but they're out there, they are steering clear of humans. And so a really important thing that we need to keep in mind is maintaining connectivity across the landscape so that those animals can move unimpeded. And even something like being out there for what seems like a peaceful ski tour is actually going to affect how species are moving and where they feel comfortable moving. So it's, it seems a little crazy to think that that might be comparable or that that can have a similar tone of influence for animals that say a new housing development or, plow, or paving over a Walmart parking lot can have, but we do need to keep in mind how our activities and where we place things can affect landscape connectivity. Why is connectivity important? Well, a number of reasons. One being straight up species migrate across the landscape. Is this better? Oh yeah, that's oh. so much better. All right, well I'll just keep moving unless you want to hear me repeat anything. Okay, great. Um, so what, why, why is landscape connectivity important? important? One reason, migration routes. Another reason, species need to disperse to establish new territories. We want intermingling between populations to main gene, maintain gene flow. And then critically, maintaining landscape connectivity is one of the most important adaptations we have to support species under climate change. You can go to the next slide, please. So already, we're watching species move northward, or southward if you're in the South Pole, and uphill in response to warming temperatures and changing precipitation patterns. So maintaining landscape connectivity and natural paths for species to move is really going to help support them track those suitable conditions. And as you can see from this map, which is a model of where we expect species to generally be moving to track those suitable conditions, this corridor that we're in, right up through the northeast, is pretty darn important for a lot of critters. So luckily, the Green Mountain Ridge Line, you can go to the next slide, please, is, is actually a pretty great existing natural corridor for a lot of species. It, ca it spans latitudes, and it also, of course, spans an elevation gradient, and is fairly well forested, with the exception of, you know, get down to the valley areas and you have agriculture, you have development, but the actual, these actual mountain ranges are, are really important for species to move. But some of our development, including skiing, is, can be inhibiting that. So next slide, please. Oh, well, yes, so great, there we go, movement corridor. Let's keep that, let's keep that open. But let's zoom into where we are right now. So we're at the base of, of Sugarbush, of course, and let's say you're a critter that needs to get from the southern end of this slide, or southern end of this, this uh, ridge line, you're on the east side of this ridge line, to the far north, you've got to cross here, Lincoln Peak, you've got to cross Mount Ellen ski, ski network, you've got to 
17 as well. And while skiing may seem like kind of a benign, you know, outdoor recreation that's not going to necessarily really compromise a huge amount of species movement, it, it can, in fact. So it, it really can, um, can inhibit species from moving. And it's just scary for a lot of them uh, to, to do so, and they're gonna steer clear of these kind of zones. So next slide. If you, if you think about being some kind of critter that wants to hang out along that ecotone between the spruce fir, all the conifers at the higher elevation, and, and below that, more the hardwoods, look what you have to cross to get northward if you're on that eastern flank of this ridgeline. So already, unintentionally, because we haven't thought of that landscape scale, we've impacted the connectivity of this landscape. And so that's something we should keep in mind in sighting in the future. And then one other facet of connectivity I'll speak to before passing the mic over to Catherine, next slide please, is, is snow connectivity. So we know that our snowpack is much worse than it was even a few decades ago, right? It's coming in later, it's leaving earlier, it's spotty and melting out. So snow consistency is something that, well, we can't really solve tonight. Figuring out how to solve global warming is beyond the scope of this conversation. but we can do something about snow connectivity. So we need to leave some freshies for the critters as well. It's, you know, everybody wants some untracked powder, but species that are particularly well adapted to, uh, to snow and snow cover, like the snowshoe hare here, which straight up changes color when it snowed, or, well, now there's a mismatch between when it changes color and when the snow falls, but has been adapted historically to, to blend in with the snow. And then it's one of its major predators, the Canada lynx, which there are a few elusive ones around, around here, that have those giant kitty paws for staying aloft in the snow. The snow is a really important adaptation for them. Or, or they are really well adapted to having persistent snow cover. And so, we, so when we interrupt that by tracking up every area, um, we're, we're, kinda, we're kinda putting them at a competitive disadvantage. So I'll leave that landscape scale consideration of connectivity and how we impact that um, for a, it sounds like, I think zooming in with, with Catherine to talk more about impacts of vegetation. Thanks, Caitlin. I think that stuff is super interesting and cool. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Ah, uh, yes, vegetation. She was right. That's what I am talking about. Vegetation and ski zones. So I've used this word a couple times. And um, I'm going to specifically talk about uh, forest structure. Um, this is a picture that I didn't draw, but it does look like something I would draw a vertical structure within a forest. So what Caitlin was just talking about is sort of what we would call horizontal structure. It's like the forest across a landscape, and there's patches and et cetera. Um, and then when you zoom in, you see the, the forest structure that is what you ski through or hike through. Um, I always say it's what hits you in the face, all that hobble bush. Um, so vertical structure within a forest, we've broken it down here, it's litter, which is the like acorns that maybe make you trip or um, just speaking from experience. Um, understory, which is uh, either small trees, it can be bushes, hobble bush, uh, et cetera. Midstory, those are kind of like the trees that will eventually become the canopy. And then the canopy are the tall trees. The canopy is what usually is prized in the um, backcountry ski zone because it's what's protecting all of your snow. Uh, so based on this, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so this is a picture from my work at Bolton Valley, and this is a section of Bolton Nordic. And you can see that there's a lot of hay-scented fern surrounded by trees. Um, and so one of the things that occurs when you're continually removing vegetation is that you actually change the structure of the forest. Um, so you can see from this picture that where the ferns are, you're missing the understory and midstory, um, and that you're mainly only seeing um, no trees right there, but are taller trees. Uh, and that can create issues related to climate change and other things um, because you can't predict um, what the normal sort of foresters have an idea of what will regenerate when they go in and um, do silvicultural harvests. 
they think to themselves, well, I know what's there, and if we do X, Y, Z, this is what will be there afterwards. Um, and when you just continually suppress something, it's unclear what the next thing will be. One thing we know from research that they've done on deer, which are, you're thinking, deer. Well, they've done a lot of research on deer because in some eastern um, states, deer are a large challenge and um, they graze regularly the same place over and over again and um, suppress the growth of new trees and bushes, et cetera. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, this isn't a picture of deer, but it's a picture to try. I'm really into pictures because I'm like a visual learner. Um, this is from Foresters for the Birds, which was created by Forest Parks and Recreation in Audubon, Vermont. And it shows, why I like this picture is it shows um, birds that use each part of the forest structure for either shelter or food. Um, so every time we're removing something from the forest, you know, we're affecting something, something else. Um, and uh, some of my research found that we also changed the composition. So if you replace beech trees, birch trees, and sugar maple with hay-scented fern, like that's a different experience as you walk through the woods. And maybe it's okay and maybe it's not okay. This isn't a judgment, but it's something we need to be aware of as we create um, backcountry zones across the across landscape. Um, and go, I think I have one more slide. Um, so that's definitely why we talk about the vegetation islands. Um, those are locations within a ski zone where silvicultural goals, goals for our forest can be managed. Um, these might include things like a diversity of age classes. That might have been too jargony. That just means that you have trees that are different sizes and different ages. You have trees that are different species. Um, maybe you have like a cool shrub or a weird little type of vegetation that only likes to grow in the shade. Um, and the intention is to maintain the forest functionality um, by providing areas where both forest structure and forest diversity can be managed. Um, so this allows sort of a thoughtful way to enjoy your time in the woods while still protecting that functionality of the natural resource that's providing you this like super great time. All those freshies, as Caitlin mentioned. Um, I think that that's it. And this just transitions into, um, I didn't want to speak too much. I talked, I touched on how vegetation indirectly affects wildlife. And I think Bob's going to talk a little bit more about direct impacts and a handful of other things. Hi. Oh, yours doesn't work. You want to borrow mine? Sure. Now you can hear me, right? Uh, hi, my name is Bob Zeno. I'm with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. Uh, I'm the state lands ecologist. I've had the opportunity to present my scientific work in a lot of venues, but never in a bar before. So I'm really glad that I asked for permission from my supervisor before doing this. <laughs> so um, I wanted to start with the mission of the Fish and Wildlife Department because it really drives where I come at from, or when I'm thinking about this. And it's the conservation of the plants, animals, and their habitat for the people of Vermont. All of them. Which, uh, next slide. That's a mere 20 to 40,000 species we're responsible for, and that we have to protect them all and keep them all here on the landscape. Uh, some of those species you know, they're familiar. Uh, robins, white-tailed deer, woodchucks. Uh, then there's all the other things that we don't know much about. Uh, we don't know much about invertebrates. We don't know much about fungi. We don't know much about mosses and bryophytes. Most of them don't have names. Uh, we can't begin to go through one by one and think about conserving 
the biological diversity of Vermont. We have to do it more efficiently. I will get back to skiing at some point, so just bear with me. Um, one way we think about having to deal with just all these species that are out there is we, we think about their habitats. We think about the natural communities where these species live. And we can classify the landscape into different natural communities. And even if you've never thought about this, or uh, you don't even have to know that much about plants and animals, and I think intuitively, I, I hope this will make some sense. There's photos up here of four different natural communities. There's a red oak northern hardwood forest in the upper right. There's an alpine meadow in the upper left. There's a black gum swamp. Black gum is a tree. It's the one in the middle of the photo. In the lower right, lower left, right? I'm trying to think backwards. Anyway, the one over there. And there's a, an alder swamp uh, in the uh, lower left. And I think you can picture that each of those four natural communities has different species associated with it. And the species that live in one place may not do as well in the other place. Uh, there's a picture of a wood turtle down there with the, the alder swamp. And wood turtles need uh, to live alongside rivers and streams. They're not going to be found in those other places. And so forth for many, many, many species. So if we can have good examples of each of Vermont's natural communities, and we recognize 97 different ones of them, we can have some confidence that all those species, whether we know everything about them or not, are likely to persist in the landscape. So that's one way that we, uh, we assess places and think about uh, their value for conservation. We think about what natural community is it, and what are the threats or impacts to that natural community. And what Catherine was just talking about, when we start changing vegetation structure in the natural community, uh, it affects the confidence we have that all the species that depend on that place will persist. So the changing the structure, uh, changing the trees that are growing there, the vegetation, the lower plants, the way that water is moving through the soil is affected by the vegetation, all those things add up to potential impacts to uh, plants and animals. So one way we would look at where should there be uh, managed glades is to think about what type of natural community that glade is in and how risky is it to put or to make those changes to the forest to build or in this case cut the glade into that community. So I'm going to leave that there for the minute and uh, let's go to the next slide. I wanted to reiterate what Caitlin said about the impact to individual wildlife. And uh, not to make anyone feel bad about being out in the woods. I love going out in the woods and getting way out there and seeing wildlife, uh, being enjoying the forest. But when we're out there, there's, there's just no question in the scientific literature that we have an impact on animals. And probably most of that impact is something that we don't realize because the animals have changed their behavior uh, before we see them or we just never see them. And there was a recent project done by a graduate student at the University of Vermont, Meredith Naughton, that summarized the scientific literature on this question. And uh, the literature is specific to uh, the New England region and our wildlife. And she found, uh, not surprisingly I think, what has been shown worldwide that the presence of people in the woods changes the behavior of animals. I think we know that, again, intuitively, because if you, uh, when we see animals, they're usually running away from us. Again, I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad about startling an animal, but just to be clear-eyed about what it means to be out there in the woods. Uh, I think we can go to the next slide. This is definitely a little heady for the setting here, this next slide. But uh, again, building on what Caitlin said about climate change and the need for species to move around, we know from work that's been done that the species that are here in Vermont, plants and animals, have not always been here. If we go back 10, 12,000 years, there was a mile of ice above us. There were no species here. They had to come back. And those maps on the right 
the colors, they, even without getting into all the details, you can see the color blobs. They represent the ranges of different species uh, starting 12,000 years ago, I think 8,000 years ago. I can't actually read the numbers from here. I have to go way around. 6,000 years ago and then the present. And the point is that those blobs that on the far side showing the present where they converge, that 12,000 years ago they were in totally different places. And I think with climate change that's happening now, which is uh, more dramatic and at a faster rate than the climate change that happened over the past 12,000 years, we can expect that species are going to keep moving and they're going to rearrange. And the things that are here now are not going to be where they are, probably even in a few hundred years. Although maybe we'll be lucky and that won't change. Also, we won't have backcountry skiing then, unfortunately. Uh, but in the meantime, we need to think about how to uh, get those species to their future homes. If we can't let those species move, and we can't do this one by one because we've got 20 to 40,000 of them that have to move around, they need to have some ability to move through the landscape, like Caitlin was saying. And when we think about those impacts to natural communities and those direct effects on wildlife, they can add up to uh, changing and preventing species from moving. Maybe not in a dramatic way, maybe it's subtle, it just eats away at our confidence a little bit that a certain place will function to allow those changes over time, but it's all those little things adding up to uh, pose a risk to whether species will be able to move and adapt into the future. And I think that's it. Excuse me. That's it for my segment right now, I believe. Next slide, please. Thanks, Steve. So I'll just I'll reiterate what, what, what Bob said. We're not trying to make anybody feel bad here, but I think it's important to account for the impacts and some of the trade-offs that we make when recreating, when putting in a new development, when doing anything that interfaces, that, that means humans are interfacing with nature. Because once we account for those impacts at multiple scales, landscape down to just the individual lichen growing on a tree, we can start to mitigate those impacts and to prioritize where we want to do things like site a backcountry zone. So once we know and we sort of catalog these impacts, we can, we can um, be more strategic about moving forward. So I'll return then as we shift gears into thinking about siting, appropriately siting backcountry zones, I'll return to that landscape scale to think about zooming way out, where should we think about doing and, 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 and building places, which, which can be a little tricky to, be, to prioritize spots because in some cases you may well only have a particular parcel available, right? But if we are able to zoom out, broad scale, then we can, we can really think about accommodating those key landscape features. So like landscape connectivity to enable the species to move. And, and as Bob alluded to, species do change their behavior. They're, they're not going to go, many species aren't going to go where humans are. And it can be really costly for, hum, for species and wildlife to encounter humans if they're trying to move across a landscape, especially in the snow. Think about startling a critter and it has to plow through some really deep snow. That's really, that's taking away a lot of energy at the time of year when there's really low, where there's really high food scarcity or they're, they're limited in their energy stores. They might abandon the nests if they encounter, if they encounter, um, and young if they encounter humans. So all these little direct and indirect ways in which us being on the landscape and, and affecting the landscape can, can directly and indirectly affect wildlife. So in thinking about siting, it's siting zones, the, the two things that I would focus in on are thinking about how to maintain that connectivity. I'm now gonna pick on the Stowe area and Smugs area, and so we, we already saw before that this, on the, the, the slope that we're on right now is, is already, in many ways, fairly well developed from here to past 17 in terms of there not being an untouched stretch of forest. Forest, all the forest between here and 17 has been touched somehow. Same goes up around in this neck of the woods, right? So, of course, Stowe in the lower part, and then there's Smuggler's Notch um, on the, the road itself, and then Smuggler's Notch, a ski area on the far side there. 
So how might we think about siting a backcountry ski zone? It would be to, yes, concentrate use so we're not undermining the intactness of other intact areas, but also um, to make sure that we're maintaining corridors through areas that do have use. So maintaining that connectivity, so natural vegetation cover and low human presence. So identifying areas where we can keep that alive, keep that connectivity alive. And then secondly, I'll bring up a second concept that we, that we really focus on in conservation in the context of climate change, which are climate refugia. So these are places on the landscape that we expect, by nature of just their inherent characteristics, to be relatively buffered from climatic changes. So for example, you could slide, or slide please, thank you. North-facing slopes and basins, those are the places that are likely to remain cooler than, say, south-facing slopes, right? So they're not getting hit by as much solar energy, they're going to retain the snowpack for longer, and especially if there's some curvature in the landscape, like in a basin or uh, a valley, you can get some cold air pooling. So those sort of areas may well maintain cooler temperatures and more snowpack longer than other spots in the landscape. So those are, we call those climate refugia, those places that critters might be able to hang out or use as stepping stones or otherwise just, yeah, just hang tight in um, to, to, to slowly evolve as, as, our, as our climate changes. So the, the challenging thing though is of course, these places that may well serve as climate refugia in the context of snow and holding onto snow are also the very places where there's gonna be more snowpack, right? And all the humans are going to wanna go. So I think that as we, as we think about siting, backcountry ski zones, we've got to leave some of these, we've got to maintain a whole complement of these landscape facets for wildlife as well. We can't be putting in uh, zones or, or tracking up all the you know, north, northwest facing basins as well. So I, I would say that those two principles, connectivity and climate refugia, are two things to keep in mind at that landscape scale of making sure we can protect those when, um, when prioritizing where we might put, where we might invest both conservation measures as well as, as um, building new zones. And then I think we're gonna zoom in even a little bit farther now. So to help think about specifically where uh, there are different values in the forest and in the landscape of Vermont, the Fish and Wildlife Department, along with partners including Forest Parks and Rec and, and many others, uh, worked on a project called Vermont Conservation Design. And this is a tool that I think anyone thinking about uh, proposing a glade or creating a glade or who just wants to learn more about how, uh, where Vermont's ecologically functional landscape is can turn to and, and get some understanding. And this was a project to map out the places that are most important for uh, maintaining all of our species into the future and then providing that long-term connectivity so they can move around over time and that when we have climate change and the place is different and species need new places to go, plants and animals can get where they need to be. It's a map that takes a bunch of different parts, well really features of the landscape, uh, ecological features and lays them together on a map and stacks them up and then the end result is that map on the right where we have forest blocks in green so intact chunks of forest you can walk into the woods and then you can walk for uh, however far you walk and at some point you come back out of the woods and you've gotten to the other side of that forest block it's a thing you can find on the ground and recognize and then the dark blue represents uh, smaller features places where there are particularly sensitive natural communities or rare plants and animals. You can get to this map on uh, the next slide. On the website shown there, BioFinder, and you can go uh, kind of like Google Earth, you can zoom around and look at this and click and you can see what all these different features are. And you can see where you can Go look at a place and start to understand what values it might have. And it can be a way, like I said, to start thinking about if this is a place where we have a managed ski glade or we want to have a managed ski glade, uh, you can get some information. And on the next slide, this is 
Uh, it's going to be a little awkward not being able to point to everything, but cutting diagonally across the map there is I-89 and the village of Waterbury. And then between the two big orange blobs going up on the map is Route 100 going from Waterbury to Stowe. And the big orange blob on the left is the Mount Mansfield forest block, which extends from 89 all the way up to Smuggler's Notch. You can see where there's not forest, the road, the Bolton Access Road going up into the forest block. Hopefully you're like sort of following with me. Maybe. On the other side, on the right side of the map, is the Worcester Range, shown in that other orange blob. Between those two big orange blobs and north of Waterbury Village, there's a small orange blob that connects those two forest blocks. It's the only place between Waterbury and the Stowe-Morrisville area where there is contiguous forest and wildlife can move between the Worcester Range and Mount Mansfield. It's the only place. Everything else is developed. It's a key corridor. If somebody wanted to propose a managed glade on either side of that pinch point, that's a place where maybe that would have a very big impact because even a small impact, relative to all the other things you could imagine happening, uh, even a small impact in that place might be too much. It just might be too much risk to all the long-term benefits we get out of sustaining biodiversity. So that could be one way to think about, okay, there's a no-go. Uh, next slide. This next one shows uh, you probably can't read it from far away because I can barely read it from here. But it's the, uh, somebody's going to have to help me, Route 73 going through Branding Gap, I think, uh, where the managed glade is in the Forest Service. And there's words in the middle of that uh, orange blob with the road in green going through. That shows where the, the uh, Branding Gap glades are. And if you're not following on the map, don't worry, because the point is that there's a long stretch of road with two big forest blocks on north and south of it. And the glade is there. And because there's so much other forest, there are many other opportunities for that wildlife and ecological connection north and south. The glade is there, but there's, it's, not, uh, it's not interrupting all the habitat. So there's a place where I think that's a well-sighted uh, feature, and it's not having it's the same impact, right? It would be the same effect to the forest as if it was placed in that spot we saw before, but it's a much different uh, risk and impact here. So it's a way to, to compare sites. Uh, let's go to the next slide. The other thing you can look at on these maps, like I said, is where those sensitive natural communities are. They're shown in red on the map, and uh, it kind of looks like meaningless to me from here, even though I know that's camel's hump shown there. But trust me, that's camel's hump, and those red shades are some important natural communities. And the purple circles show places where there are rare plants and animals. And they can be red flags for thinking about where features might be sited, because those are key uh, parts that we want to protect. We want to protect rare species. We want to protect important natural communities. So. Uh, not necessarily a, a necessary no-go, but something that would raise flags probably to most land managers. So you can go and see that in advance. I believe that's my last slide. And I was just going to end by saying that I hope that that's a helpful tool to take some of the abstract concepts uh, and put them into practice when thinking about this question of where, uh, where recreation can happen on the landscape. Thanks. Well, thank you all. Um, <clears throat> I think that one of the things I want to say, we were hoping to have a presentation on, there's been some monitoring at, at Brandon Gap, and unfortunately, um, don't, aren't able to have that presentation here tonight. Um, but 
you know, I think when we think about how we move forward from here, um, one of the things I, I hope that comes across is that um, you know, I think often we think about trails and we think, oh, we're just we're just building a trail. Like there's there's subdivisions everywhere, there's highways, there's all these impacts that humans have on the landscape. We're just building a trail. What's the big deal? And um, obviously, I run a trail organization. I love trails. They've played a huge role in my in my life, and I think they're a, a really positive thing. Um, but it's also a little, it's also quite a bit more complicated than that, and the science is, is quite robust. And I think, as, as everybody's said, that's not a reason not to have trails. It's not a reason not to go into the woods. Um, but we we know that um, you know we can do better. I think as a as a trails community, and I, I hope that that this sort of helps helps show sort of the depth of the research that is out there and, and some of the tools that are available. Um, and one of the things that I'm, I'm really excited about as we move forward is that a lot of this work um, has been codified in a, a collaborative process that Catherine mentioned between the US Forest Service, the Catamount Trail Association, our chapters, Forest, Vermont Forest Parks and Rec, Bob worked on it, Fish and Wildlife, and, and many others, and we're calling it the Vermont Backcountry Handbook. Um, and it will, hope, we really hope it will be a, a sort of comprehensive guide to um, the best of our knowledge around how to um, create backcountry zones. It goes well beyond the ecological impacts and um, talks about working with land managers and mitigating risk and, and all the other um, uh, things that go into backcountry skiing. Um, but it does include a lot of this information as well and hopefully helps to you know, translate some of this science and make it available to people who are interested in how can we do, uh, have great skiing and minimize our impact at the same time. Um, and, and as we've talked about, I, I think the beauty of backcountry zones is that to me they're more than a compromise. Right? You, can, you can ski in most open land in Vermont if it's not posted and if, it's, if it was just you know, you and a few of your friends, and, and you are the only people out there ever, it might be a different, a different story, but we know that's not the case, right? We know there are more and more people in the woods, and as there are more people in the woods, those impacts get amplified. And so, um, one of the beauties of backcountry zones is that, as, as Bob sort of talked about, if we appropriately cite them and focus them and, and pair that coarse landscape look with ecological analysis of the site to make sure that we're not impacting um, rare and endangered species and, and that sort of thing. Um, we can end up in a place where, A, we know that we've, we've sort of mitigated our impact on the landscape to the extent possible. Um, we can monitor it because we know where the use is um, and we can look for, for ways to improve what we're doing. Also, um, for anybody that's been out there, I think it, it's just better skiing too, right? Like, <laughs> We live in Vermont. There's not a lot of, you know, natural, naturally open, you know, 1,500 foot vertical foot runs in Vermont, right? That that doesn't really exist. Um, but when you go to Brandon Gap, you know, you can you can ski some big runs. When you go to you know Braintree or Willoughby or any of these other places, um, they flow well. They they ski beautifully, um, and and so I th I think it's it's one of those um, situations when we can can really have multiple benefits um, for, for skiers individually and for communities at large. So um, I'm going to leave it there. I had some questions, but I also want to be conscious of the time and, and really want to let you all um, have a chance to um, ask questions of our, our panelists and get engaged in the conversation here tonight. So um, I want to open it up to questions. Um, if you have a question, you can either maybe just raise your hand or make a line over here by um, in front of me and um, if you can just um, sort of say your question to me and I'll just repeat it out um, via the mic so that everybody can hear it and we make sure it gets on the recording and um, we'll go from there. Yeah, any questions out there? Don't be, don't be shy. Come on up. Maybe just say it loudly and I can hear just the... Yeah. Raise your hand, we'll pick on you, and then shout out, take the mask off, 
Yeah, and then I'll, I'll repeat it too, but shout, okay. yeah, just shout it out. Hey, my name is Kai Koyuk, I'm a background engineer, I live in Facebook. I'm also a wildlife biologist, a lot of my research is focused on moose habitat here in Vermont um, and other areas in North America, and also the factors that affect moose habitat quality and quantity. And you were pointing out how there's, you know, big blocks of forest, how putting an obstruction in the middle of it isn't a big deal because there's plenty of room for wildlife to travel on either side. However, winter habitat for moose is concentrated more, most moose in central Vermont, winter in the Green Mountain Range, in the conifer forest above 2,000 feet. So if we look at that, and we would just put a map of moose habitat across the state, it narrows that width of poor forest and we're putting these ski areas right within that. As many of you may know, moose are in serious decline. In 2010, their numbers were around 5,000. Now they're less than 2,000. So in a decade, uh, we have half as many moose because of um, global warming issues. Parasites uh, do better in warmer temperatures. Uh, moose get heat stress both in the summer and the winter. Their produ productivity is lower. Uh, we have higher calf mortality. Uh, because of ticks, and here we're stressing uh, the animals in their their primary habitat in the winter that they need when they're less, when they're most stressed. So how do we justify putting these areas within those important uh, moose habitats? Yeah, I think that's a great point, and that I think of moose as one of the animals that's. Uh, probably that I've seen most frequently when I'm out skiing, that you're coming up to the top of a ridge and all of a sudden there's a moose there and it goes uh, running off through the woods. And uh, that's an energy drain on the moose. And then you think about, I was there at nine o'clock, the group after me came up at 10 o'clock and then uh, back up for a second lap at 10.30. And that moose just keeps getting uh, pushed and pushed around, and it's just using energy when it's uh, probably barely eating enough to uh, keep its weight during the winter. Uh, one small impact, you know, one person might not be a big impact, but you start multiplying that over all the people out there. And I think it just shows the importance of having redundancy. You know, your point that you're making is that we need redundancy of habitat so that we don't have a situation where there are pinch points and where uh, moose can't find uh, like Caitlin was saying, high elevation areas with those characteristics that are uh, un... Lost my train of thought in terms of where I was. So we don't have areas that are, all those areas disturbed by people where the moose are wanting to winter. So we need that habitat redundancy and we do that by mapping it out, understanding natural communities and uh, making sure that we're not impacting all of one type. Is there other stuff to add? just add one other thing that, that Bob kind of alluded to there. Of, yeah, you're taking your run at 9, then somebody else is at 10, 10.30, on and on. And I think that while we're talking about prioritizing space here on the landscape, we also need to be thinking about time as well. And one, one thing that places can consider doing would be to not allow recreation, say, at night, for example. And I know I live in Richmond, and people are out fat biking and mountain biking, myself included, into dusk, into dark, with lights. And there are a lot of critters out there that are only going to be most active during those times. And so thinking both about prioritizing spatially as well as temporally and limiting our activity, that can be one way to minimize impact, especially for those, those species that are most active um, when they think we're asleep and then all of a sudden we show up and they're most active. Um, this is more of a process uh, comment, but sort of what you just brought up around moose is also um, why we explain in the Backcountry Ski Handbook that Matt mentioned uh, the pretty rigorous, um, pro I keep saying the word process, review, <laughs> the pretty rigorous review that um, proposals go through both if they're proposed to the Forest Service or, or to FPR uh, because each, we, 
in our jobs, we're always thinking of large scale and small scale. Um, so that's all. Yep. The last thing I would just say very briefly, and um, I am not a, not a scientist, so I won't put my foot in my mouth and, and speak to that, but from a policy standpoint, right, one of the, it's been mentioned here tonight, but backcountry skiing is a, is a form of dispersed access, which is um, legal on, on almost all, the vast majority of public land and the vast majority of conserved land in Vermont, which is a, a pretty decent percentage of our, um, of our rural landscape. Um, and so to, to channel Holly Knox, who who's works at the, the Forest Service, um, it often says, right, the decision to not manage is still a management decision, right? And so if we're, if we're not managing for this use and the use is high enough and everybody is sort of scattered across the landscape, you have to sort of balance that with the concentrated use that comes with, with zones and in thinking about you know, all, all sorts of impacts. But certainly, you know, I, I, I think moose habitat would, would be one of those. So. Thank you. Um, Steve Sharp here, Mad River Valley Backcountry Coalition. And so I think just sort of spinning on this particular thread related to moose and uh, that particular species, I think uh, those of us who've been skiing uh, backcountry in Vermont for a while know that uh, many of the natural zones, truly natural zones, often are, are the areas where the moose are active. Um, so the moose are our friends, and so that's certainly something we want to make sure we, f we support and foster. Um, climate change being an extra stressor uh, on those species. I guess my question is related to data and what the literature review shows. Unfortunately, like Matt said, we had a presenter who was lined up who couldn't make it last minute from the Green Mountain National Forest. They've been monitoring Brandon Gap for the past five years or so um, and collecting data and they have a, a preliminary uh, report that uh, unfortunately they were going to present tonight but not available to do so and I think if you if you uh, get a copy of that report it is public domain um, it, it's interesting to look at what they've done in terms of the monitoring methods and, and protocols and the uh, preliminary conclusions that they've found. So I, I would encourage you to, to uh, maybe see if you can get that report. Um, I, so I'm kind of wondering about what, what's the, what are your colleagues uh, and what are yourselves seeing in terms of the monitoring work that you're doing specific to moose in, and backcountry ski zones? Um, well, Bob is from Fish and Wildlife, but I, um, I work in the forestry division, so we mainly focus on um, counting how, we, we focus on vegetation. Uh, so like how many trees there are, what type, what size. Um, I'm not familiar with any work being done by my division on monitoring for uh, around moose. Um, but as we talked about how vegetation is an indirect um, corollary for wildlife. Um, we, we do have a lot of information on the vegetation where moose live. <laughs> but Bob might have a better answer. That's all I have for that. I would have to, we have a lot of data and I would have to look through it more closely to answer that question more in a more robust way. <laughs> oh, do you need my microphone? Sorry. I'll just say that uh, I don't think anyone in uh, the state government is monitoring moose specifically in reference to skiing. You know, the Fish and Wildlife Department does statewide monitoring of the moose population, and we have good numbers, uh, a good sense of the population, and, you know, it's in the Northeast Kingdom and it's in the Green Mountains. Uh, not surprising because those are the habitats for moose. Uh, and moose are declining due to factors that are Really, uh, you know, as, as you were saying, it's climate change. It's related to uh, the winters and the impact and feedbacks that has on uh, winter tick, a species that parasitizes the moose, and that's a whole other story. But uh, 
Uh, in terms of specifically to skiing, I don't believe there's any uh, direct monitoring, maybe at least at the state level, maybe in the Forest Service. Are there any other questions out there? I'm not seeing any hands, but. Okay, um, if folks have additional questions, um, please don't be shy, raise your hand or, or come on up. Um, but one thing I'd love to talk a little bit about is um, sort of how we, you know, we um, talked about some, some big ideas tonight and talk a little bit about how that we translate those into sort of concrete projects on the ground um, because I don't think any, I don't think that any of us are here to say like this means there shouldn't be backcountry ski zones or, or any new trails built, right? Um, but there are there's certainly things to keep in mind. And so um, Caitlin is going to speak a little if you have speak a little bit to sort of what this process has looked like in Richmond um, and and uh, sort of ground it a little bit in some. Um, or a concrete project for us. Great, thanks Matt. So this is not specifically about a backcountry ski zone, but this is about trail development in a fairly recently acquired town forest for trail use for all, all activities in all seasons. So a couple of years ago, 2018, Richmond acquired a about a 430 acre parcel that's now called the Andrews Community Forest. It um, if, actually, if you could switch back, Steve, to the forest block page that um, the one with the green a couple tabs ago. One more, yeah, there we go. So, so the Andrews Community Forest is a parcel that's embedded within the that you can see the dark green of Mansfield State Forest and the dark green below 89 of Camel's Hump, and there is a, an area there of conserved lands that's not state owned, but that's called the Chittenden County Uplands. And slowly over time, local land trusts and BLT and other groups have been trying to acquire land um, to, to conserve and to help to maintain the integrity of that forest block that, that, that really, with the exception of 89 and Route 2 and the railroad, and for some species, the Winooski, um, is, is pretty well intact um, all the way from Mansfield into Camel's Hump. So anyway, we acquired this great parcel. And um, like I alluded to a little while ago, sometimes it's hard to be able to take that landscape scale approach if you only have a certain parcel at your disposal, right, for development of something. But, and this was before my time on the, the Community Forest Committee in Richmond, the, the town went through a really rigorous public engagement process that involved a lot of local wildlife experts as well, like Sue Morse with Keeping Track, to identify what the management goals should be for this parcel, given that it's really a key piece of that entire stretch of intact forest habitat. And so the initial, initial forest management plan said, we want, yeah, we want trails, people should be able to recreate, but we're going to keep it to a minimum in terms of mileage as we get farther from Route 2. So we're gonna have a few little connectors, but we're not gonna just pepper this place with trails because we know, as, as Bob's mentioned, as Catherine's mentioned, we do, humans in the woods just affect animals, even if it's a peaceful walk. Again, doesn't mean we shouldn't go in the woods, but let's acknowledge that, then we can mitigate those impacts. So anyway, the process that we've undertaken in the past year to carry out that management plan is one that I'm, I'm pretty proud of, but that has still ended up a little contentious because all things at the town level are contentious, right? So it's, it's contentious for a variety of reasons, but I'm really proud of fundamentally the process that we undertook to develop a potential trail network. And I don't know if you all know, I think it's one of the first times that in the state that this process has unfolded as it has. So typically what happens when say a town or, or a, a private, anybody seeks to build a trail network, they might hire a trail design firm and then at the, Right before that trail goes in, after it's all been mapped out, you might get an ecologist on a landscape to be like, oh, well, nudge it over here, there's a rare plant there. Oh, well, you want to shove it that way a little bit because that's a deer yarding area, whatever. Instead of doing that post hoc, we said, no, 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 we want ecologists in from the get-go. And so we hired a, we put, put on an RFP and got a couple bids and hired an ecological consulting group that was worked jointly with a trail design firm, 50-50, equal footing. And it was the first time they had ever done that, and they both spoke to how much 
well, I think it was a lot of work, but what they learned from one another. And so it was an iterative process between them of, okay, well, we know that we want to capture this feature for, this would be good for bikes, this would be a good site, you know, scenic view. Uh, but we got to nudge it that way because of this natural community. So it was this iterative process that we ended up with this trail design network, which is still a map, it's still in concept, it's not on the ground, it's flagged. But that is, that is influenced with, by ecological considerations from the get-go instead of as an afterthought. And so I think I might encourage any trail network or any backcountry zone moving forward to, yeah, take that landscape scale approach when possible. Look at the sort of blobs, that, the orange blobs, the green blobs. Look at all the blobs. The blobs are important. And try to you know, place things in the landscape in that way, but then get the ecologists in there as soon as you can. Um, I think that that's, that can help inform the process instead of, like I mentioned, often happens as an afterthought when it's in some ways just kind of too late and you're not really taking the broader picture into consideration. So that got back to being a little abstract there, but yeah, high, hire ecologists too when you design trail networks is what I'd say. And then come and enjoy Richmond's trails once we get through the whole public process. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, just looking around. One thing I, I'd love to ask, um, I'll maybe start with, with you, Bob, and then others can, can chime in if they want. Um, we sort of talked a lot about, or talking mostly here about planning and, and design, um, but is there anything, you know, obviously we've, people can go out and ski, right? And so is there anything people can keep in mind as they do that to sort of help um, help minimize their, their impact on the landscape. And I, I guess sort of, we all know that one of the big ones, of course, is don't cut illegally, right? Um, and that, you know, sort of goes without saying, but, but we need to reiterate it continually. But um, in addition to that, um, are there, there are things people can keep in mind as they're, they're out in the woods? Yeah, I think uh, one thing that's really easy to do is pay attention to what you're seeing. And if you are startling that moose, uh, particularly if you're encountering animals again and again, maybe that's a sign that, you know, maybe give that run a rest and move somewhere else down the ridge and just give them a little space. Like I said, a lot of times you probably won't know that you're uh, having an impact on wildlife that's there, but if you do, it's pretty easy usually to just give them their room. Uh, this one's pretty specific to a few areas, but I think it's a really important one because of the alpine ecology. When you're on top of Mount Mansfield or on top of Camel's Hump, uh, really try to be careful of that alpine vegetation. It's fragile, it's easily damaged by walking on. This is like probably the broken record that you've heard, but it's, it's true and we can see impacts from people walking around up there. And, I think skiers walking around in the spring on alpine vegetation is actually more of a threat because of the waterlogged uh, plants and soil at that time of year than the hikers in the summer. So uh, not trying to be negative on those people. I, I get it. It's really cool up there. Uh, but it's just something to be aware of. And the, the plants have a huge impact on uh, many invertebrate populations that are tied to those species. So it's, it's not just plants, it's wildlife too. Uh, finally, you know, the, the not cutting vegetation piece is, is a big one. And also when you're scouting lines in the fall, a lot of wildlife use that time uh, for energy gathering. And it's a time when they need to be out there getting food, finding nuts. And one of the, the things that's really important is mast stands. Uh, where there are beech trees or oak trees, and bears and other wildlife will use those areas very intensively in the fall. And they'll be easily disturbed by people for all the reasons we've talked about. And so those are good areas to just give a rest in the fall. And I know that's a good time to go out and find lines because you can see through the woods. I love walking through the woods at that time of year. But those areas are just uh, good ones to give some room to at that time of year. I'll just throw out one other thing that I mentioned before, which is thinking about timing as well. So if you can limit your activities to daylight hours, 
that's that's great. I know it's really hard when we only have two hours of daylight this time of year, but if if possible to avoid the evening, especially and then into the nighttime, that's when a lot of critters are just trying to get out and get some food. So that's that's one way to uh, to to minimize your own personal impact. And then again, you could think about that more broadly for what it means for for example in Richmond, we're we're considering, you know, we want to allow we allow hunting, but do we want to limit? Um, do we want to live in activity after sunset, for example, would be a way to kind of codify that. Thank you all. Um, other questions out there? I, I, I think unless um, you all have, have anything that you'd like to add that, that hasn't been thrown out there, um, that we can we can maybe leave it there. But I, I just not to be a broken record, but would just reiterate that um, you know obviously there are a lot of there are a lot of considerations going into this. Right, we've talked a lot about uh, sort of the context on on public lands and, and landscape scale. The process looks different with private land. Um, you know, there are a host of considerations that we could spend a lot of time talking about that we, we didn't tonight, things like parking and, and um, access and traffic and um, the user experience, right? Um, at making these, these places fun to ski. Um, and, and all those are, are important, um, but, but our impact um, is too, and it is something um, that at least at the CTA we're, we're doing our best to, to elevate as a consideration. Um, and I, I think the last thing I'd say is just that, you know, we, we have the tools, right? We, we have a lot of knowledge. We know how to implement this. Um, and there are resources, right? So, um, you know, we get involved in, in local chapters throughout the state, um, the Catamount Trail Association, um, public land managers, the, the state of Vermont, the U.S. Forest Service. There are a lot of resources to support this. Um, uh, in addition to, to organizations that support things like town and community forests. So um, lots of opportunities to get involved and, and help um, make more great skiing um, out there. And we, we do have a question. Yeah, come on up. Just on that, sorry, go for it. On that, uh, how many chapters are in Vermont or working with state agencies to cite backcountry ski zones in Vermont right now? Maybe I missed that earlier. No, that's a good question. I can I can speak to that. We currently, the Catamount Trail Association has six chapters, um, so we're a statewide organization. Um, we have uh, two chapters in in Southern Vermont, the Southern Vermont Trails Alliance and the Dutch Hill Association of um, Skiers and Hikers. Um, both of those are in Dover um, and Reedsboro, Southern Vermont area. Um, the Ridge Line Outdoor Collective in Rochester and Randolph area. MRVBC here in the Valley. Um, there's a chapter in the Northeast Kingdom and another up in the, the Jay Peak area. Um, so they're sort of dispersed throughout the state. Um, the CTA is, is here as a resource to support communities outside of those, those chapters and, and certainly um, in, are willing to do that in, in a variety of ways, whether that's a new chapter or, or other um, you know, supports uh, short of that, whether it's resources, information, um, Help with help with uh, land managers and state agencies. Um, we we really try our best to sort of meet communities where they're at and and do our best to support um, great projects and great skiing um, that sort of that fits with the with the community. But that's that's really where it needs to be driven um, in our view. So um, give us a call, send us an email, and uh, we'd love to chat. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for being here. I, it's an incredibly important conversation, and I really appreciate you all taking the time to be here tonight and, and um, to, to listen and, and um, learn from this. Um, and hopefully it, it's, it's something that we can carry forward as, as organizations and, and individuals. Um, from here, it will, this will also be, it's been recorded and, and we hope to post it online. Um, so look, uh, look for it there, MRV TV is here, thank you. Um, the Catamount Trail Association will be posting it as well. Um, thank you again to all of our panelists, thank you to Sugarbush for hosting us, MRVBC for um, pushing this really important conversation and, and facilitating this evening. And uh, Steve, do you have any last words? I can, I can pass it on to you for the final word. Thank you, Matt. Thanks to everyone for being out tonight. Thank you to the panelists for making it. 
out and uh, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, this is definitely something that MRVBC uh, wants to continue to do as an annual event. So I hope you'll uh, spread the word. Thanks again. Have a good night.